Yep. Yep. I think you want to go yes and then no, 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 no. okay all right okay Do you want to... okay we're on our final talk of the session and it's going to be snarks from p for p from sub exponential ddh and qr and james is going to give the talk all right yeah uh thanks for the introduction uh so this is joint work with uh rutha dakshita and akshay uh so i wanted to start really quickly by just kind of quoting the uh headline result of this paper um, so what we show is that for any language uh, that can be decided in time uh, t of n, we give a non-interactive proof system uh, that is succinct. Um, so the proof size and the verifier time um, are both n times t to the little of one. Um, importantly, this means it's going to be much uh, fast, or it's going to be much more efficient than just trying to uh, solve the original problem directly. Um, and we have security against any uh, adversarial prover um, that runs in time polynomial in t. Uh, where this security is actually based on the sub-exponential hardness of both uh, decisional Diffie-Hellman and quadratic residuosity um, with a security parameter that's t to the little of one. Uh, so for this talk, I'm actually going to be presenting a slightly weaker uh, intermediate result, um, where instead of just relying on having a time bound for our computation, we're also going to rely on having a space bound S, um, and we allow both our proof size and our verifier time to go linearly with the space bound. Um, so this is kind of our main technical contribution in the paper, um, and there are known techniques from a couple of uh, prior papers that actually allow us to remove this dependency on the space, um, and so get back to the main result. Um, but yeah, this is going to be kind of what I wanted to present here, because uh, it's uh, nicer to, to give it in a, in a, a single package. Uh, so putting this in context of some prior works on SNARGs, um, there's been a long line of work uh, starting in the 90s, um, trying to construct SNARGs either in the random oracle model or from various uh, strong cryptographic primitives, such as obfuscation, uh, some optimal fully homomorphic encryption, or uh, other such uh, primitives. Um, and only more recently have there been uh, works that have started uh, looking at building SNARGs from falsifiable assumptions. Um, so the first of these was a paper of uh, Kalai Panath and Yang, um, which uh, was able to build uh, from a falsifiable assumption, although it was actually a new falsifiable assumption, so it's not one that had been studied uh, in any prior works. Uh, following up on this, there's a paper of Jawali et al., uh, which actually shows that from uh, sub-exponential uh, LWE, uh, so something that's been a little bit better studied, uh, we can actually get SNARGs for deterministic computation, um, provided that we're willing to limit ourselves to only deterministic computations that can be computed with a bounded depth circuit. Um, the, the next kind of two relevant works that I wanted to look at are a pair of works by uh, Shadri, Jane, and Jin um, that actually, instead of considering deterministic computations and building SNARGs for those, actually considered uh, languages that can be understood as a batch NP statement um, and showed that either under sub-exponential DDH and QR or under polynomial uh, learning with errors, uh, we can actually get SNARGs for these two, um, or for these sorts of languages. Um, and this latter paper, along with a separate work of Kalai Vekatanafin and Zheng, actually shows that um, under uh, polynomial LWE, we can actually uh, take these uh, SNARGs for batch NP and turn them into a SNARG for a deterministic computation. Um, but uh, what we want to do with this work is actually uh, essentially do a similar sort of thing for the uh, first Shadri Jen and Jin paper. Um, and that's actually what we do, is we were able to show that uh, we still get uh, these um, SNARGs for deterministic computations, um, but based on sub exponential GDDH and QR, as opposed to basing them on uh, polynomial learning with errors. Uh, so to give kind of a brief overview of the techniques that go into this paper, um, this is going to kind of happen in three steps. Um, so the first step is we take uh, a notion that was previously defined called fiat chamber compatibility, um, and we show how to actually take this notion and make it work for argument systems um, instead of just for proof systems. Uh, we then introduce a new interactive argument um, that can actually work for uh, any language decidable in time t and space s. Um, and then finally, we show that this new interactive argument actually uh, can satisfy the definition uh, that we gave for um, fiat schmier compatibility for arguments. Um, and that's enough to tell us that we can actually compress it into a non-interactive argument, um, which gives us our final result. Okay, so starting with the first point, uh, 
kind of an, an overview of uh, fiat Shamir compatibility as it was originally defined for proofs. Um, so we'll say that a proof is fiat Shamir compatible uh, if it is round by round sound, meaning essentially at every round, there is only a small number of possible bad uh, random challenges the verifier can give. Um, and as long as the verifier never makes any of these uh, small number of bad challenges, um, no prover can actually succeed in fooling the verifier. Uh, on top of this, we're also going to require that the set of bad challenges can actually be efficiently enumerated. Uh, so what uh, we try to do now is we want to say, uh, can we now take this notion and generalize it to also apply to arguments? Um, in particular, the notion of round by round soundness is very specifically defined for proofs, um, and it's not immediately clear how we can define it for arguments, although there have been previous works that have uh, been successful in actually starting from an interactive argument and then compressing it um, in similar ways to uh, what we can do with fiat Shamir compatible proofs. Uh, so our, our notion for how to actually make this work for arguments uh, is we're actually going to consider arguments that have multiple modes. Um, and what we uh, intuitively want to say is that no matter what strategy the prover uh, uses, there should be some mode where uh, the proof is actually fiat Shamir compatible under the original definition. Um, so there's uh, uh, this, this idea of using an argument with multiple modes and hoping that one of the modes is correct uh, has been used in uh, a variety of previous works, um, both in the construction of SNARGs and in uh, other constructions. Uh, so more formally, what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, our setup algorithm, um, in addition to whatever other inputs it would normally take, is also going to take a mode index i. Um, and based on that mode index, it's going to, in some different way, uh, construct the CRS uh, and then is also going to give us some additional auxiliary information, aux, um, that other parts of our um, definition will use. Uh, now, kind of the, the, the interesting part is what we're going to say is we're actually going to introduce this predicate phi, which intuitively is going to capture, uh, did we actually choose the right mode for this particular prover strategy? Um, so phi is going to look at whatever instance the prover is attempting to prove. It's going to look at the first prover message, alpha one, and it's going to look at this additional auxiliary information, aux. Um, and if the predicate is satisfied, then what we want to be able to say is that um, our protocol or our argument system is actually uh, round around sound um, with these efficiently enumerable bad challenges. Um, so we have to be a little bit more careful than this. Um, in particular, uh, based on how we defined it right now, there's no guarantee that a predicate is ever satisfied. Um, and so somehow we need to capture the fact that um, this predicate should be satisfied a good amount of the time, because um, otherwise it's not going to be particularly useful to us that um, it actually gives us this uh, round by round soundness. So the way we capture this is uh, in what we call a non-trivial predicate. Um, so for this, we're going to say, uh, so as we have a security game, we're going to start by uh, randomly sampling uh, some mode index i, uh, we're going to run setup with respect to that mode, uh, and then we're going to give just the CRS, but not the auxiliary information to our adversary, who is then tasked with uh, outputting an instance X and a first prover message alpha one. Uh, so we'll say that our predicate is non-trivial. Um, if for any efficient adversary A that actually outputs uh, something not in the language with uh, noticeable probability, we actually have that conditioned on this instance not being in the language, uh, the uh, first message that it outputs must actually satisfy the predicate also with non-negligible probability. Um, and so now this is going to give us some sort of sense of saying that the predicate should sometimes be satisfied. Um, and so we'll say that uh, an argument system is fiat Shimmer compatible if it, is, uh, uh, if it satisfies the definition on the previous slide with respect to a non-trivial predicate. Okay, so now that we have some sort of notion of what actually is a fiat Shimmer compatible argument, uh, let's actually look at the structure of the argument that we create. That's not my next slide. My next slide is, is saying, uh, why do we actually want to have this definition the way we did? Um, and so essentially what we're going to say is any argument system um, that satisfies our definition of fiat Shimmer compatibility can actually be compressed into a non-interactive argument system um, in particular, by uh, using correlation and tractable hash functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the prover actually generate all the verifier's random challenges, um, but they're required to do so by putting the uh, transcript 
into this correlation intractable hash, um, where what we want to say is essentially that um, uh, what we want to say is that uh, I lost my words for a second. Uh, <laughs> We want to say that uh, it should be hard for the prover to actually come up with a bad challenge. Um, and that's in particular why we want the bad challenges to be efficiently enumerable, is because that actually allows us to use uh, these correlation intractable hashes. Um, so for our particular work, we actually use a uh, correlation intractable hash from a, a paper of Jane and Jin, um, where we say uh, under uh, DDH, we actually have these correlation intractable hash functions where efficiently enumerable just means enumerable by a low depth threshold circuits. Um, so as long as we can show that our uh, eventual argument system can actually be, or can actually have its uh, bad challenges enumerated by such circuits, um, that will be sufficient for us to actually use this uh, correlation intractable uh, methodology. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, our actual proof of, our sketch of proof of security is going to say, well, suppose that there was some adversary that was able to break the soundness of our non-interactive argument system using these correlation intractable hash functions. Um, the first thing that we're going to notice is that uh, because this adversary is able to break soundness with noticeable probability, it actually has to output an instance not in the language with some noticeable probability. Um, and so by the non-triviality constraint, we know that whatever this adversary outputs must actually satisfy our predicate phi with non-negligible probability. Um, and now what we're going to say as well, if phi is satisfied, we actually have that our argument system has the standard notion of fiat chimera compatibility. And so we're able to essentially repeat the argument from uh, Joel et al to say that uh, any adversary that is able to uh, break soundness can actually break the correlation and tractability of the underlying hash function. Okay, so now is when we're actually going to get on to uh, looking at the structure of our particular interactive argument. So the uh, kind of key idea behind this construction is recursive proof building. So we're going to say, suppose we have some argument system for uh, smaller computations. Let's use that multiple times in order to build up an argument system for larger computations. Um, so very similar ideas um, have actually shown up in a, a prior work of Rheingold, Rothblum, and Rothblum. Um, although their particular uh, proof system there is somewhat different from ours because they had a different goal in mind. Uh, so let's imagine we have our prover and our verifier, and our prover has some time t computation that they want to prove to the verifier was actually done correctly. So what the prover is going to do is they're going to split up the time t computation into k smaller blocks, each of size t over k, um, where k is some parameter that we're going to end up setting carefully. Um, and then the prover is going to imagine uh, snapshots of the computation at each of these uh, boundaries between the t over k blocks. Um, so S0 is whatever the, uh, the computation starts at, S1 is the state after T over K steps, and so forth. So the prover is now going to send all these intermediate snapshots, S1 through SK minus one, to the verifier, and this will define K uh, computations, each of size T over K, that the prover now just needs to show the verifier all of those were done correctly. And so the way that the prover is going to do this is by engaging in K parallel invocations of a uh, protocol that works for any time t over k computation. Um, now we have to be a little bit careful here to make sure that uh, the size of these proofs doesn't blow up when we recurse. So in particular, when the prover sends the first message of these k parallel invocations, um, they're actually going to send them under the hood of a uh, compressing commitment. Um, and for security purposes, it turns out that this compressing commitment will actually want to be somewhere extractable. Uh, now, similarly, we don't really want the verifier to be sending over uh, k separate random strings, because again, that will likely cause the, um, the size of the proof to blow up. So we're just going to have the verifier sample a single random string and use that as the random challenge for all k of these uh, parallel protocols. So at the end, we're going to have uh, this, uh, we're going to have these protocols happening in parallel. Um, it's going to go for however many rounds are needed. And now the verifier really just wants to check that all k of these argument systems would actually have succeeded. So the t over k verifier should have accepted all k of these subcomputations. Um, unfortunately, the verifier can't check this directly um, because all of the, uh, the transcripts are all under a commitment. Uh, and so the verifier is actually going to engage with the prover in another argument um, where the prover attempts to show 
that whatever they committed to uh, in this first phase actually does correspond to K accepting transcripts. Um, and so this can actually be understood as a batch NP language. Um, and so this is going to be where we actually use uh, previously known arguments for batch NP. All right, uh, so uh, we now just want to show that uh, this argument system is actually fiat Shamir compatible under our expanded definition. And kind of the first step towards doing that is actually defining the predicate that will tell us when it is fiat Shamir compatible under the uh, original definition. Uh, so intuitively, what phi is going to do is phi is actually going to capture whether our somewhere extractable commitments are actually extractable at a position where the prover sent uh, invalid snapshots. Um, so we want to check to make sure that whatever proof we can actually extract actually corresponds to uh, an invalid t over k computation. Uh, we have to be a little bit more careful than this, though, um, because we actually need extraction to be working at every level of our recursive protocol, not just at the top. Um, and so we're actually going to define our protocol, or sorry, we're going to define our predicate uh, recursively. Um, so we're going to start by defining a predicate at the top level, phi t, um, that's going to uh, check if these uh, t over k snapshots correspond to an invalid computation. Um, and if they do, then it will actually extract the first message of the corresponding proof uh, from the first message of the time t proof, um, and then uh, check to see if phi t over k is actually uh, satisfied uh, given that first message. Uh, so given this predicate definition, uh, we actually have to argue somehow that it's non-trivial um, in order to uh, tell us that uh, we actually have our fiat Shamir compatibility. So kind of the key observation that allows us to uh, get non-triviality is as long as the overall time t computation is not actually correct, there must be one pair of snapshots that is invalid. Right? If the, if the uh, computation does not go from S0 to SK in uh, T steps, there must be some I such that the computation doesn't go from SI to SI plus 1 in T over K steps. So what this tells us is that if the prover gets no information about the extraction index, uh, and we're just choosing this extraction index randomly, then we have at least a 1 in K chance of just randomly selecting the correct index that allows us to uh, extract an invalid pair of snapshots. Um, and now the nice thing that we want to use here is our somewhere extractable commitments actually hide their, ind their uh, extraction index from any efficient uh, adversary. And so in particular, no efficient adversary can actually take this probability and make it smaller than 1 over k minus some negligible amount. Uh, so if we put this all together and do a little bit of arithmetic, um, we'll see that actually the probability that all of the extraction indices are good is at least uh, 1 over t minus some negligible amount, uh, where because t is actually going to be, uh, in this case, the number of possible modes of our uh, argument system, this will actually uh, satisfy our required definition of non-triviality. Uh, so the final thing we have to do is we have to show that uh, as long as our predicate holds, the argument system actually gives us uh, round by round soundness with um, efficiently innumerable bad challenges. Uh, so we're going to actually split this into two phases. Um, the first phase is what I'm going to call the emulation phase, um, which is where the prover and the verifier are engaging in these k parallel invocations of the smaller protocol. Um, so in this case, what we're going to say is, well, we know that the predicate holds. And so whatever proof we're able to extract from this phase must actually be for a false statement. And so we can say, well, by induction, uh, we can say that whatever proof we're extracting actually itself has uh, round by round soundness with efficiently enumerable bad challenges. Um, so we're just going to say a challenge is bad for our overall time t, comp or for our overall time t proof um, if it would be bad for this uh, particular extractable t over k protocol. Um, and now based on the, uh, the fact that the number of bad challenges is small and they can all be efficiently enumerated, we can say that in the emulation phase, we do actually have um, the necessary uh, requirements on our bad challenges. Uh, so the second phase to consider is what I'm going to call the batch NP phase. Um, so this is where the prover and the verifier are engaging in the batch NP argument um, to show that all of the uh, emulated arguments would have actually accepted. Um, in this case, we're going to do a very similar thing. We're going to say, well, as long as there were no bad challenges previously, um, whatever transcript we're actually able to extract from the emulation phase would be a rejecting transcript. 
Um, and so we're going to use a fact um, about the particular batch MP argument we use, which is that as long as the extractable witness is false, or the extractable uh, transcript is false, um, the uh, batch MP that we use will actually be, um, uh, will actually have ramp around soundness uh, with these efficiently enumerable bad challenges. Uh, so again, we're just going to say um, in the batch NP phase, uh, a challenge is bad if it would be bad for the argument that we're using uh, to prove the, uh, that the emulation phase was done correctly. Okay, uh, so this kind of concludes the technical material I had. I have no clue how I am on time, uh, but yeah, thank you. And I'll take any questions. Plenty fine for time. Okay. <laughs> okay, which means we've got time for questions. Anyone? Stand silent. <laughs> no? Shock them. It's so <laughs> clear you don't need to answer any questions. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's thank this speaker and all the speakers again from the entire session. <laughs> And now there's coffee or something. <laughs>